All righty, I'm going to start with the welcome and then um, we'll begin in a few minutes. So welcome everyone. Sidak Atna Kostan, Sidak Stephanie Carroll, Tishu Sas, Landak Nauchina. Hello, I'm Stephanie Carroll. I'm Atna, a citizen of the native village of Kudika along the Copper River in Alaska. I'm from the Paint Clan and my dad is from the Down from the Sky Clan. And then I have two dogs from my maternal grandparents and my Sicilian descent. Um, and I am an assistant professor of public health and the associate director for the Native Nations Institute at the University of Arizona. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of our US Indigenous Data Sovereignty Network, as well as a founding member chair of the Global Indigenous Data Alliance and the RDA International Indigenous Data Sovereignty Interest Group. So I acknowledge the Tanatham Nation on whose unceded lands Tucson, where I'm sitting now, is located, and I pay my respects to the Pasquayaki tribe, whose people also share these lands. I also want to acknowledge the indigenous peoples of Costa Rica, on whose lands we were together for this meeting. Uh, finally, I acknowledge the indigenous peoples and their lands on which you all sit, recognizing that the work which we gather here today emerges from a commitment from each one of us to acknowledge the power and equities and system systemic racism that affect the ways in which we currently govern data. So on behalf of the International Indigenous Data Sovereignty Interest Group and the Global Indigenous Data Alliance, I welcome you to the Defining Indigenous People's Rights to Indigenous Data session. This session will consist of a focusing presentation by myself and Maui Hudson um, and a series of potentially uh, large groups dis discussion and breakout discussions, depending on how many people we have here. Uh, and so um, we will be actively using the collaborative notes for this session, especially uh, during some of our discussions and, it, and if we do have breakout sessions. So I'm going to put that notes link in to the chat right now. Um, and also I'll do it later if we have other folks joining us. Excellent. So um, I'm going to give Maui a chance to introduce himself while I start to share my screen. Kia ora koutou. Um, just want to uh, add, my acknowledge, uh, add my support to the acknowledgements which Stephanie has made. Um, my community is the Whakatotia Nation in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And um, I myself am an Associate Professor and Director of the Te Kote Research Institute at the University of Waikato. Um, I've been a member or a founding member of Te Mana Raraunga, the Māori Data Sovereignty Network and the Global Indigenous Data Alliance and working, working in alongside the Indigenous Data Sovereignty Special Interest Group of the RDA uh, involved with the process of developing the care principles as well. So I think in lots of ways this um, session becomes a little bit of an extension um, or a little bit of a, a, a track that sits alongside the care principles, but just thinking more about um, in what ways are Indigenous rights and interests, um, how can can they be thought about? So looking forward to the looking forward to the session this afternoon, or this afternoon in New Zealand. Kia ora. Excellent. So I do want to let folks know that we um, intend on having engaging discussion here today. So um, we will utilize the chat function for people to put in, or you can raise your hand. We'll try to, between the two of us, be mindful of um, paying attention to those so we can bring people into the conversation. So we're going to begin with just a quick brief background to get everybody on the same page of where we're coming from, and then we'll present some of the the rights discussion and on which we will focus for the, the balance of our time here today. So briefly, indigenous data are information or knowledge in any format. So anything that can be digitized um, that impacts indigenous peoples, nations and communities at the collective and the individual levels. And so broadly it's data about our resources and environment uh, data about us as individuals, and finally data about us as collectives and peoples. Indigenous data sovereignty then is the right of indigenous peoples and nations to govern the collection ownership and application of their own data. So um, really grounded in and deriving from inherent inherent rights to sovereignty position within a human rights framework that leverages, for instance, like the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, but also 
um, other court, case, court cases, treaties, recognitions, um, and really finds genesis in the ways that indigenous communities have um, held for since time immemorial in terms of the traditions, the roles and responsibilities for the use, um, conveyance and care of community held information. So there's a, a, an important um, link for indigenous data sovereignty in terms of governance in that indigenous peoples um, have a need for data um, and to inform governance decisions, to inform um, uh, actions that they take as collectives, but they also at the same time are working towards creating systems and reinstituting systems to, to govern that data. And so um, we talk about how indigenous nations are rebuilding and their both their data systems and um, their nations simultaneously um, and data is, a, is a, an important component of that. So uh, uh, in terms of um, the availability of data and access to data, um, most indigenous data are not fair. Um, we're dealing with situations where um, indigenous collections and data can be difficult to find. They can be buried in larger collections, data sets or repositories, often mislabeled, not properly attributed, not searchable. Um, and they can range from a whole host of um, disciplines or, or places, um, especially since we talked about the, the real range of what um, indigenous data include. So every indigenous community has enormous, vast, vast amounts of collections of tangible and intangible cultural materials, knowledge and data that are held in a variety of places. Um, and as I mentioned, some of, uh, significant information about these collections, um, including individual and community names, proper provenance information are missing. And indigenous peoples and communities are largely not the legal rights holders. Issues of responsibility and ownership, as well as the incomplete and significant mistakes in the metadata continue um, throughout the digital life of the material. And uh, so there are huge volumes of data and, and collections that already exist. And meanwhile, there are more and more researchers working and collecting data and samples from indigenous communities ever than ever before. And so we have the need to address both um, legacy or, or already existing data held in these variety of places, as well as uh, moving forward, how do we, from the beginning, make um, data fair um, and also address the rights and interests of indigenous peoples. So the, the care and the stewardship and the governance of this of indigenous data really relies on um, enhancing data relationships. Tribes as the sovereign are the rights holders to these data, um, but there are, there are numerous data stewards out there. And the intention is to move towards um, the stewardship of, da of data by within falling within tribal standards, um, how indigenous peoples want their data to be cared for. Um, and that requires us to establish um, and strengthen relationships um, and the policies and practices um, and laws and infrastructure that build that up. So across the globe um, now today, there are four uh, indigenous data sovereignty specific networks in the, the what we refer to as the Kansas countries. I apologize for my email digging. Um, in, um, New Zealand, Australia, the United States, and Canada. And we've worked um, very successfully through this RDA um, interest group here for a number of years. And then last year, we launched the Global Indigenous Data Alliance. And so, um, yeah, the uh, coming together as the Global Indigenous Data Alliance was really reflecting the fact that the challenges that communities are facing are essentially global ones because the um, networks networks of sharing data are connected um, are being connected internationally. So GIDA is an international network focused on advancing indigenous data sovereignty and governance. 
Um, and a big part of that is for a lot of places, and this was this was true in New Zealand as well, um, was around asserting rights and interests in relation to data. And um, it's happened in a whole variety of other places where um, Indigenous communities have had to assert their rights in relation to other sorts of resources. Sometimes those have been land resources, sometimes they've been, uh, say, fisheries resources. And as data has become an increasingly valuable commodity in some place, uh, you know, in, in, in a number of ways, um, how, what the assertion that they have rights and interests in relation to that as well. Um, and part of it has been, as Stephanie was describing, uh, wanting to be able to access that data for governance and sometimes being around um, the governance of data, but it's really at its core advocating for data that supports the well-being of the community and reinforces the rights to engage in decision making in accordance with indigenous values and their collective interests. And so, oh, okay, you're, that's right, you got the slides, Stephanie, next one. So we've been um, fairly successful in the sense of, of getting some advocacy around the ideas, uh, idea of Indigenous data and the need for um, greater Indigenous control of Indigenous data. We're conscious that the the definition of indigenous data that we have is very expansive and that control will look different in different places so the, the ability to control information which you might be collecting yourself uh, which you have ownership of um, where you possess um, you know thinking about the OCAP principles um, ownership control access and possession if all of those elements uh, fit with what you have, then it, it becomes uh, a much easier proposition to um, not only uh, claim a right, but assert it as well. Uh, when you're dealing with situations where the indigenous data you're dealing with actually sits in a, a crown, a government institution or a, another research um, institution, then your ability to uh, influence how that is controlled um, varies uh, as, as your data becomes part of a larger um, kind of network or data sharing environment. Once again, it, it shifts in terms of your ability to say that you can control what's happening with it. So the things we wanted to try and think through are um, how, what sorts of rights might, might we be talking about or do we hear um, communities expressing when they're talking about wanting to have greater control of their data? And so that's what we've um, really setting this up for the conversation this morning and exploring these initial ideas uh, that we've had as a special interest group uh, around one, how the identities um, how digital identities are constructed. So my community is my community that lives in, um, in Oportuki. We know each other through our interactions and how we connect, but how we're represented uh, in other places and other digital environments is often different from how we would think about, think about ourselves. And so what does that mean in terms of our abilities to have a say on um, ourselves, but also to have a say on what's happening uh, or how we are represented in these other places. So there's four different types of rights which we've um, suggesting exist. Uh, the right to self-determination concerning the ability to organize and control data in relation to a collective identity. Um, I think this element of the collective identity is an interesting one to be thinking about um, in the context of uh, GDPR and individual rights that are being strengthened in different, different localities um, and what it means to have um, be self-determining at, at the level of the collective. 
Uh, the second one is the right to consent. And so we know that um, consent is being reinforced in different ways for individuals, but the right to consent emerges as an expression of digital autonomy and the ability to accept potential harms. Uh, the right to association. The right to association concerns a recognition of provenance and terms of attribution. So um, things that are indigenous data, which might be being turned or uh, turned into other products or um, derived works, uh, what, what rights exist in relation to how you can be associated with those things. And then the right to privacy. Uh, so the right to privacy relates to the protection of collective identities and interests from undue attention, includes the possibility of requesting erasure. So can we translate those ideas about um, uh, individual privacy and the privacies that are, and the way those uh, privacies are being constructed and reimagine them um, in the context of, of uh, collectives? So we've constructed those first um, those first four rights, kind of nominally in the in the area of indigenous data sovereignty, and then the other component which we um, often talk about is the responsibilities associated with looking after the data, and um, how how those are then connected to the community. So thinking about the relational responsibilities. Um, and here we have the right to use. So the right to use reflects the ability of individuals and collectives to use data for their own purposes. The right to govern. Uh, the right to govern supports participation in protocols and decisions about access to data. The right to benefit. The right to benefit supports the opportunity to benefit from the use of data and equitable benefit sharing from derivatives of data and the right to know. So the right to know is concerned with the ability to track the uses of data and who has access to them. So you'll see there's a uh, definitely an interrelationship between uh, these elements and the rights that were associated more with Indigenous data sovereignty. But these are the eight um, different, um, different characteristics of uh, indigenous rights to indigenous data. And these are what's also represented within the, um, the Google document, which we're quite happy for people to um, put comments on and suggestions. So next slide. Ah, there we go. So I think, um, we're hoping is really just opening it up for a discussion uh, to get people's thoughts on the ideas that we've put forward here in relation to these rights and whether there's any characteristics that are missing or elements which should be should be thought about. You want to um, stop sharing for a bit, Stephanie, and uh, people feel free to put up your hand or just start talking. Well, I, I hate the sound of silence, but I'm also really not the best person to actually speak here. Um, but what I thought I'd do is just share why I'm here um, and hopefully others will feel motivated to sort of, yeah, then join in. Um, so I uh, work for an infrastructure provider in Australia um, and as a data infrastructure provider, I'm really keen to understand how it might be that we are able to support everything that you've just mentioned so we are not 
you know, experts in indigenous aspects at all, but we definitely understand that we need to be able to cater to them. So kind of that's, that's my interest and why I don't feel that I'm well equipped to actually, you know, contribute to the question that you just put to us. Could it be that we're missing a bit of a, a, a beat here about then the, the right to own infrastructure or the right to, to be involved in infrastructure planning uh, that's going to create this data as well? I know we're talking about data, it's the, it's the crux of what we do, but I wonder if there's something there about infrastructure as it becomes clear that they're more intertwined. Oh, and sorry, my name's from McCafferty. I'm based in Australia. I'm a first generation New Zealander um, and Scott as well. So um, I've been in a few countries uh, and very interested to see the threads here being picked up and um, seeing how I can be involved in, in helping this move along. Okay, so maybe, um, oh, so let me make two statements. One is, um, we knew this was going to be an open, um, a chance for an open conversation. We've had our own conversation um, amongst the special interest group. And so we're really, um, in lots of ways, just wanting to test the ideas. So feel free to throw up questions. Uh, you don't have to help us find the other Indigenous rights, but it might be, um, uh, it may be that some of them, you actually got questions around, whether it's why we think it sits there or, or um, you know, just kind of generally anything. I might may I just make a, another comment. You seem to have a great deal of representation from Australia at the moment. Um, seeing the first three people to speak all come from Australia. And um, I'm from, uh, I'm representing at the moment an infrastructure in Australia that's environmental and it's about collecting data about our natural heritage uh, and current things like uh, carbon capture, gas exchange, but also biodiversity. Um, I personally have in, been involved in bio, my father for many years with um, uh, in interaction with indigenous communities fairly peripherally. So I'm not a direct uh, and I cannot um, say I'm, we, no, we're not an anthropologist or anything like that or ethnobotanist. Well, my father might be. But why I'm, I'm very interested in this on a personal level as well, in other words. So there are two, two aspects to this. One is, is time and the collection of biodiversity data, for example, on Indigenous lands way back. Um, and you will know this, <laughs> won't you indeed, uh, Maui, um, way back that there might have been engagement and there might have been permission or partnerships of some sort that are now being and have been revisited on several occasions subsequent. Now, so not even once, but several occasions. So there's that historical perspective and how you deal with that in a fair and equitable manner. Um, particularly when some of this information is extremely valuable to the best management of our natural heritage into the future. And data, obviously, shareable data is important. The second thing is, of course, the modern day, where something like TURN is, uh, again, launching, you know, trying to set up long-term observatory systems and how best you develop a partnership with the knowledge of that experience in the past and how can you do that better now what you're doing hopefully will help but so did people think so in the 60s or whatever so how to make this stick is something of interest anyway thank you very much and i'm speaking from Wichable country by the way in, uh, in australia which is a wonderful place to be and i'm very lucky to be here <laughs> in the sixth generation australians have nothing from Europe. <laughs> so. uh, I'm not sure Stephanie's going to have a go at this, but that's um, so just a, a, I guess there's a, a, a couple of things in that. Um, 
And part of it was some of the um, points that Stephanie was making when she was talking about that a lot of um, a lot of data or indigenous data sits in collections that you know have been built up over time. And so we have this sort of historical element where either um, maybe conversations took place or maybe they didn't. You know, often they didn't. Even when they did, the information about those engagements wasn't collected. And so knowing um, uh, knowing kind of what the provenance was or what sort of protocols or, or conversations being put in place just isn't available. And so I think one of the things we're interested in, and particularly as you know, there's people here that are involved with establishing um, these infrastructures, which are supposed to carry you know, data from the past to make it available into the future, not only the historical stuff, but you know, that the data that's constantly being generated now is to try and address some of those um, some of those issues. So, in what ways, um, in what ways might these things help with thinking through what types of um, mechanisms need to be in place within the infrastructure? Um, you know, certainly um, one of the projects had been working on around or, or supporting around traditional knowledge labels and biocultural labels as a way of trying to create digital tags um, that can be maintained through through metadata. Um, but that you know might be something that kind of connects to the um, association or the right to know what's going on. It doesn't necessarily address some of the other interests that um, communities have been expressing as well. Yeah, could I just ask a question because we did something in turn, uh, which I did with a, a very excellent group of Indigenous people, which was set up a biocultural atlas, which we got a prize for. It was a spatial digital delivery of biocultural knowledge of where Indigenous people had been used, uh, Indigenous knowledge had been accommodated. It's interesting because that got a short amount of traction uh, and we're revisiting it again. I'm talking only six years ago. Um, you can't find that website. You can't find, for various reasons, it, how, it was the local to national sort of thing that I would think about as a European. We in, and it was a, a good group, Emily Ennis was involved, who is well respected in Australia. Um, and we engaged with uh, a few very good Indigenous groups and people, but not with everybody. And how do you get that engagement across such diverse communities when often, and this was historical data, when often, you know, you might have engaged with 10 groups <laughs> that we collected and presented. It wasn't a problem, by the way, we did it correctly, but to carry that forward needed much bigger trans uh, group engagement so and and people don't remember there's this forgettery of, of the discussion and so we don't build on previous discussions as much as i think we could stephanie or jen do you guys want to have a <laughs> I have a question that maybe is related to 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 this last uh, intervention. Um, it's because uh, well, uh, I'm uh, Gabriela from Gabi from Costa Rica. I'm from Universidad Nacional, and uh, I think uh, well, that's a, a quite new theme for. Costa Rica and for our university and sure for our indigenous uh, communities and people in in the in the way you you treat it in the way you have been working it okay and uh, well my question goes because my, my worry is that not all the communities and nations and are as um, uh, how, how do you say that? No, it's not. Well, not everybody have the same way of the same uh, road 
or the same place in the road to nation identity and, and sovereignty and all that. Okay, there's a lot of communities that are dealing with what to do, when to do it, and they really do not have that strong identity in all the ways that, that you can feel the identity. They, they can say, okay, well, land. Well, yes, land is quite uh, clear and sure, but maybe not other uh, teams or other knowledges. And uh, how, how do you recommend for those communities to begin that road to, to be clear on, because I can see people inside communities here in Costa Rica saying, well, which data do we, what, what, which data do, do we think we can share or we cannot share? There are a lot of points of view inside each community and there are people that will say, okay, yes, that, that, that data can, can be shared, but other people will say that the same data will not be shared. But that that have to be that, that is something that is part of what you are. You, what is your identity as community? What, what do you think you can be sh sharing or not? How how because I see that I guess in New Zealand and Australia, and maybe a lot in in the United States and Canada has been. Uh, working in that road for a long time, but not in Latin America, and definitely not in Costa Rica. Then some points of view around that, around how can communities can begin that road? I think this is a great question for you, Stephanie and Jen. Um, I'll take it. I'll, I'll take it. And then Jen, you can fill in because I think you'll probably have some stuff to add. So I, I, I think, um, you know, early on in our discussions of Indigenous data sovereignty, even within um, the U.S. context, we talked a lot about how um, there's no wrong place to start. Um, and generally, you start where you are. Um, so if you have a pressing need or there's a current situation, um, you can start there. And, and I think, you know, within a community, there's that, um, uh, the kind of buildup that you speak of that's different um, based on nation states, but also um, varies greatly within, um, within nation states too, in terms of the, the experience and capacity and capability. Um, but I also wanna raise the issue of the flip side of that, which is, um, kind of the, the capacity sharing that needs to occur for those who are working with um, indigenous nations to be able to recognize that sometimes what they might expect to see, so like a data sharing agreement or um, specific written out governance structures aren't going to exist. And you know, for us here in the US, it's pretty much taken us until this last month for our federal government to outright write in federal documents that there are responsibilities to indigenous communities around data, even if those, if those responsibilities aren't written um, and the infrastructure and the governance systems don't already exist in the ways that researchers or the federal government expects them to be. Um, and, and I think that's something that we all, I mean, I, I'm, an, I'm an outside researcher too. I need to recognize that I have responsibilities when I work with communities um, to identify and, and work within their existing systems that vary greatly. Um, and, and that we all have some structure within our communities to be able to do that. Um, I'm gonna pitch to Jen now. Sure. Hi, I'm Jen. Um, I haven't introduced myself yet. I'm Jen Walker and I'm from uh, Canada, from Ontario, Canada. And I'm Haudenosaunee um, from Southern Ontario, from Six Nations of the Grand River. Um, so um, I think that for sure, uh, I, I, I hear what you're saying. And I think that um, I think it's really um, hard to know because you know a lot of this work in in Canada um which is where I have most uh, where where my experiences started in the 1990s 
um, like in terms of data, like data specifically, data governance, data sovereignty. And so, you know, for my whole, um, you know, adult life, <laughs> that's, it's been that way, right? We've had these, these movements and these strong movements to data governance. So where do you start that if, if, you're, if you're stepping onto the path? I think it's different than if you're stepping onto the path when there's nothing already, you know, like we often speak in metaphors of snow because I'm from Canada, <laughs> but like where the snow has been packed down a little bit, then you can walk right. more easily, right? So you can, you can start to see that, that, that that's possible. Um, so there are, um, I think that the way that it evolves is very different depending on treaties, um, depending on um, culture. So, you know, there's maybe cultural differences and traditional governance structures that already exist that would influence data governance. There's treaties and relationships uh, that exist that would influence governance. Um, so those things are really unique to different communities and nations. Um, but there's also some things that maybe are a bit more universal that can be incorporated and thought about. And some of those might be like the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So grounding in rights, if you don't have a treaty to ground in, might be a way to think about it, right? So thinking about those rights and those principles that have been developed. So um, Maui talked about the OCAP principles, which were developed in, and, um, in Canada and really like by First Nations. Um, but you know, we have there are, there are other sets of principles and other sets of like, um, yeah, guidance around uh, data governance that might be helpful. So yeah, I think it's a really um, like exciting thing to think about. Um, but drawing on all of those that that knowledge that's already there, I think will will guide you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just um, just just add on a little bit too the. Um, it's a relatively new term, but it, it draws on issues and, and you have to think about what is the purpose in which you might be applying it. So for one community, they might be concerned about um, how their traditional knowledge is being used or misappropriated by others. And so being able to talk about kind of data sovereignty in that context is more about those cultural intellectual property rights. And that's you know, those sorts of conversations have been taking place in a whole variety of communities for, for a long time. And it's sort of one of the things that's now captured under this term. Um, and you think about um, uh, the way researchers have gone into, um, into different lands and territories and done work without getting permission, um, extracted genetic resources. You know, that's, that's been talked about in the context of uh, research ethics and you know other different protocols, and so the the data that's generated from that is an, it's a claim. You know, it's another claim to be involved in things that are happening with stuff that the community is interested in. It probably isn't called data. It's probably you know it'll be called something else, but um, because those things um, are transitioning from whatever that space is and becoming data. And then as it becomes data, all of a sudden it's shared and accessible by people even further away than the, the ones that came in and sort of went to that, went to that place. It's, um, it's sort of even harder to, harder to stay involved and harder to stay in the loop. And that's when it becomes useful to, you know, as Jen said, talk about, well, there's these declarations, there's these rights that we um, that have been mandated at a global level because we know they're actually um, not being put in practice at a local level, and that's and I think that's um, a part of even though we know um, that people might not be able to action it in their local areas at the moment, it might be something that's available in the future, and if we can. Um, ensure that the, the structures enable it rather than make it harder. So it was, it was kind of talk about, um, we want the structures to support good people to do the right thing and to make it harder for bad people to do it. 
said and often it's the other way around you know people trying to trying to recognize um uh, uh different sorts of interests that indigenous communities have they don't have the right field to put it in um then it just becomes too hard and it doesn't happen that's important that's apply a lot for universities Um, can I add something here? My name is Gil Nelson. I am uh, in the United States, associated with the University of Florida and the Florida Museum of Natural History. And I, um, I direct a program called IDIG Bio, which is a National Science Foundation funded project. We work with approximately 900 and I don't know, maybe close to 950 collections in nearly 400, 350 to 400 institutions that are mostly natural history collections. So we have lots of biodiversity data. We are an aggregator. So we take data from all of these museums. We help them digitize and uh, help them import or move their data into our aggregation unit. We work very closely on a worldwide level with the ALA, Atlas for Living Australia, in Canberra, and we work closely with the Global Biodiversity Informatics uh, Facility, our information facility in Denmark. We work closely with some other European colleagues, um, South American colleagues. And so our goal is to try to make data available. And because we're funded by the US National Science Foundation, the 125 million or so records and 40 million images we have of objects are available to anybody. Uh, there is no requirement and we have access through APIs. We have access through portals so people can go through portals and people with um, the skills can use the API to get the data they want. And um, that's a long background. And the point I wanted to make is that, you know, there's a lot of effort um, for conversation at this point in the US and across Europe about repatriation of data. And in some cases, the repatriation of the objects that those data represent. And so we're on the other side of, of what you were just talking about. And I, I think that, um, you know, the repatriation of data is fairly simple. Uh, I mean, it's available, um, it's public, and anything that we have published, anybody can use the repatriation of objects is much more challenging. Um, and we know that some communities and some nations would like their artifacts, whether they're archeological, anthropological or, or biodiversity, would like them returned because they uh, assumed that they were taken before the country had laws to govern it. And when the global North was uh, operating in the global south, trying to find new places to discover things, um, that that has become a problem. So I don't really know how to do that latter part. I don't know how to repatriate. One of the issues is if we're if a museum in Europe or the U.S. is repatriating the objects, they want to do so to a museum that they are fairly certain will have a long-term existence so that the objects will not get lost. And so those are the things that we're kind of dealing with right now. And uh, you know, I don't know if making the data available through our portals um, is the same thing as repatriation because it's available, um, or do we need to send data sets to countries that, um, that want those data sets? Uh, and what about countries that uh, we were just talking about that might not be at that point? where they don't have the infrastructure to deal with it yet. So that's a big, long question. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a big, long question, and I'm not quite sure what the question was, but I'm going to give you an answer anyway. <laughs> good, good, good. The, um, so, so uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's been, there's been some interesting conversations thinking about um, what access to data looks like. And, um, you know, as you were talking, just because you've made it open, does that mean that it's sort of the sort of access that 
particularly the communities are looking for themselves. So we're just about to start a project um, with my community uh, here in New Zealand where uh, we're working with um, some of the cultural heritage organisations that are doing digitisation programmes to make um, their material available publicly to everyone. I mean, it's already publicly available, just is just kind of shifting into the you know digitisation project. Um, we will do a digital repatriation of the data. It's essentially just a copy, but taking it into um, our own archive. And the reason for doing that is so that we can then um, actually add it together with material which we'll get from as we work through other agencies as well and use it to create content in the ways that we might like to represent it. So just more as a base for then doing something else with it. And I think this is um, kind of the point that Shaban was making about um, you know, what sorts of infrastructures are available to then um, make use of the data in different ways. And uh, so that's uh, at, the, at the same time as we do, um, do the exercise of repatriating the data, we're also intending to put um, the traditional knowledge labels on the material that stays within the institution. And so in that way, even though it's still available to everyone publicly, um, our sort of community protocols will be present and available for anyone else that's accessing to know what's, um, what our preferences around or what, our, what we think appropriate use looks like. And so we can see that as a um, kind of a mutually beneficial um, exercise uh, in, that, in that area. I think that's a, a good answer. I like the idea of um, putting traditional knowledge labels on um, specimens and tracking that in our databases so that we can say, we do track, we track where things come from. We know the provenance of the, of the objects that were collected, but um, we don't always know the importance of those objects to an indigenous community. Stephanie, what's what's our next stage? Do you want to go through? Sure. So our next stage is. Let me just hold on. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm going to relaunch the the um, slides for you. Okay, so we um, really been thinking about well, what we were, what we had thought in our mind as we put together a session, as it would be able to talk about these uh, rights and then uh, think about different ways in which they start getting put into practice. And so even though uh, conceptually, those would be the things that we're, we're thinking of, how do, they, um, how do they become real and what sorts of mechanisms are able to do that? Sort of right across a whole range of areas from some of them might be able to be dealt with them uh, through law, other ones will be more policy interventions or things to do with ethics or getting into um, infrastructures. And I think, as we've been um, talking just in this last section, you know, elements of all of those things have, have um, been highlighted. Next slide. And so what I was really just trying to do is um, give a few examples of, of how this is happening in different places. And so here's an example of how indigenous values are being used to inform a data access protocol. So in New Zealand, um, Statistics New Zealand's our official statistics system. They aggregate um, administrative data from a range of government agencies. Um, they identify it and they make, make that um, linked data set available to uh, researchers on application. When they apply, um, they, need to ask, uh, they need to answer a range of questions that are associated with 
these Māori values. And um, they align in some ways with the five safes, which was the framework which they were using. But thinking about other people accessing the data, do they have appropriate expertise, skills and relationships with the community? Um, will their use of the data maintain public confidence and trust? Um, are they using good data standards and practices? Uh, is there a clear purpose and action for uh, what the use of the data is? And are they balancing, are the risks and benefits being balanced in an appropriate manner? And so this, um, this framework is relatively new. It's um, been trialed over the last 12 months and operationalized in the last few, uh, within the last couple of months. Next slide. And here's, um, here's an example of how uh, Indigenous rights might be recognised within data infrastructures. And as we are talking before about traditional knowledge labels, um, here's, uh, here's what they look, up, uh, look like. I see Jane Anderson has just joined us. Um, she was the developer of this system, um, working alongside Indigenous communities to um, ensure that uh, their protocols are reflected in metadata. Um, some of the work that I've been involved with was around creating guidelines and guidelines are useful for um, researchers that are engaging with communities and guiding, and guiding appropriate behaviour in the generation of data. But the conversations that, that might be had there don't often translate into a place where next users are able to access them. And that's what the point of um, the labels is, is they reflect, um, they reflect not only the provenance of it, but the protocols which the community think are important um, as durable and persistent metadata. Um, the icons themselves are stable, but the, the data associated with this is customizable. And this is being used in a um, variety, across a variety of communities and institutions. Next slide. And here's an example of um, just as uh, we were mentioning how the, the la while the label remain, or the icon remains stable, you can see that the, um, the community associated with this label has used their own language and um, reflecting what they want people to know. And so uh, going from, really going from the place where um, you've got a way of reflecting um, local protocols, but having it become a part of a, um, an institutional environment, um, and then how that can be shared across, you know, between and across institutions starts to move you towards thinking about what kinds of standards are in place and uh, this project that's just started in the last few months with the IEEE to develop a recommended practice for the provenance of Indigenous people's data, trying to really think about if there are, um, if traditional knowledge labels were sitting within um, a wide variety of systems or, or institutional databases, would they be all sitting in the same place? And what would the and 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 where should they uh, where might that information relating to provenance sit? And if there's other systems that were developed, that they also kind of sit within the same like um, like-minded places. And part of the reason for this is that as uh, we move to more and more forms of machine learning and artificial intelligence to make sense of you know. All this data that's available to us that the indigenous data can be found because if it's all sits in an other field there's no differentiation that can take place so really thinking about um, what kinds of fields are necessary to ensure that um, indigenous data is fair was consistent with the fair principles from an indigenous point of view and then um, uh, 
other forms of data are also consistent with the, the care principles. Oh, I think that might be the next slide. No, yeah. So um, here's an Indigenous framework, the care principles for Indigenous data governance. Uh, this was the work that was produced by um, this special interest group. Um, following the workshop that was held in Botswana in, what was that? 2018, 2018. And you can see at the bottom is the um, recent publication that's been released about um, its development. But the key principles are uh, talking about collective benefit, um, authority to control, responsibility and ethics. There's a session tomorrow um, where we're wanting to start exploring um, how they might be operationalized in practice. But on the next slide, you'll see that we have been, oh no, you won't. Um, maybe it's a slide after this. Is there another slide? Yeah, there's, um, you'll see that we've been thinking about uh, how, the care, uh, how the FAIR principles are very data centric and about how the, um, the data is organized and available so it can be kind of linked and, and shared across platforms. Um, but the care principles are purpose and people centric. So it's about what the data is being used for. And in that way, they're complementary sets of uh, principles. And we've been working with the FAIR uh, data maturity group to think about whether we can um, follow the processes they use to create criteria for FAIR and think about what sorts of criteria are necessary to um, implement the care principles as well. So um, I don't know how you want to roll the next part, Stephanie, um, whether you just want to stay as the whole group, but we can flick back to the, the questions. And back one slide, and I'm not sure, um, kind of not sure whether these are sort of the right ones for the next stage, or we just have a, um, a general discussion, continue the general discussion. I think we might just go towards continuing the, the general discussion here. I don't know how other people feel. I think we have a few of us so we can make that decision. So I see Allison's making a comment in the chat box. It was just, um, I suppose my interest was, I think I've got it better that what you're talking of, what you've been talking about is the rights of the people who are, who have delivered the data or whose ancestors or whatever had delivered the data and that we should respect that. And we've got some structures in place to help that. Um, I suppose I, I suppose I was interested and concerned about how um, persistent, using a data term, how persistent that might be, and how generally it's across time, and also, and have you got the right structures in place to help that happen, you know, so that an agreement is good, and then also, um, does it matter, or is it always going to be the individual or the community or the nation? I was talking about groups, I could have talked about mob. Um, yeah, if one group does it, does it matter that some other, yeah, does, does it have to be, at what level does an agreement have to be made, I suppose, or does these rights have to be done by? Or am I off the planet completely? I'm fine if I am. <laughs> so. No, I feel like you have a lot of questions in the one question, though. Like, it's a lot of, there's a lot of different things. So, um, so you know, I think that um, to the point about does, at what level do agreements have to be made? So that I, that's one question, then the persistence um, and, and whether it, it, it can survive on, is another question, but the the idea about at what level are the agreements needing needing to be made? So, you know the cons 
I, this is again it kind of comes to what are the um conceptualizations of governance that exist um for the nation that you're talking about um or working with so for example um you know, and, and how has that evolved and been impacted by colonization and things like that? Like, it's all one thing. <laughs> so, for example, in in uh, um, in Ontario, which is the province of Canada where I live, although, so to, speaking of Canada as the nation, but then we have our Indigenous nations um, as well. And now, so Ontario as a province, the like, the not as a province, but as a land mass, had 13 distinct nations before contact. So there were 13 First Nations in that region. Um, we now have 133 First Nation communities because of the fragmentation and the, the impact of colonization and the establishment of Indian reserves. So the way that governance is conceptualized today is at that individual nation level. So um, although there's some traditional governance that happens at the sort of nation level as it was conceptualized before, but really like that, that nation level um, sovereignty, so the sovereignty sits with the 133 distinct First Nations in Ontario. So when we talk about agreements at like an Ontario level or at a national level, it has to respect that sovereignty that sits at the community level. So if one community, so let's say my community, Six Nations, wants a, an, an agreement about their data with some provincial organization or federal organization or a research organization or something like that, they have the right and the sovereignty to do that. And that can't be interfered with by anyone else. Um, so as that collective builds up, so we have some agreements that are with between the Chiefs of Ontario, which represents the 133 First Nations and other entities, but it has to be passed by resolution from all 133. So I think it de determines that you know, where the sovereignty sits in the conceptualization of governance determines where those agreements have to happen. So here, I'm talking about this very local experience in Ontario. It's 133 sovereign nations within Ontario that have to collectively decide about the, about the way that those agreements work. So in the, in the First Nations governance model in Ontario, that's how it works. So I don't, I, I don't, I can't generalize that to everywhere, but I think what's important is understanding um, where the sovereignty lies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stephanie, did you have a comment about the persistence part? Well, I thought you or Jane might talk about the persistence and durability part. <laughs> Jane, do you want to have a go at that? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I mean, which part? Which part? Give me some more parameters there around. Oh, just the 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 challenge of of maintaining provenance or. Uh, ensuring provenance sits as things move from historical collections into the future. Yeah, I mean, I jumped in really late. I'm really sorry. Um, but one of the things I was listening to was uh, when I came in was just this kind of question about um, historical collections and um, the, the, the real challenge of knowing where they actually come from and finding them and um, what that means. And when you kind of note the historical colonial failure to properly acknowledge where things have come from, you create challenges when you move them from analog into the digital and those particular problems um, repeat themselves because that metadata isn't there to start with. So how do you get that metadata? Um, and so that the only way to get that metadata is to work with communities um, and for communities to um, you know, create different kinds of um, 
possibilities of sharing that material uh, and not everything is, is should be shared or needs to be shared either. So kind of working out the different parameters for that. Um, but I think, you know, what, what we're trying to move towards with some of the initiatives that we're creating, both care and the labels, um, uh, are different kinds of, I think maybe you had it on a slide earlier, these relational responsibilities. What are the responsibilities that um, uh, institutions have that researchers might have to communities in relationship to making sure that that information is always already there. Many of the challenges we're dealing with are that it's not there and it was never thought to be important in the first place. And now we've kind of got to this 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 moment where actually data sovereignty, um, like knowledge sovereignty, like sovereignty over lands, um, is critical. And so, what are the what are the ways that we build that so it can be persistent? in the ways that it's actually experienced in Indigenous community contexts. That's, I guess, what I would add. Sorry, I don't know if that's coherent. Great. <laughs> Thank you. I guess I would say one other thing, um, which I think is really interesting, is about this um, this dimension that uh, the way in which data moves cross borders and cross boundaries uh, in 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 ways that other kind like the ways in which nations have tended to try and govern particular rights and particular kinds of um, movements of, of of resources and maybe go back to what um, Jennifer has been saying about the um, the integrity of the um, sovereign uh, rights that communities have and are recognised as sovereign governments and how particular agreements that are put in place have to um, recognise and maintain and understand that sovereign relationship. Um, mm -hmm. And the movement of uh, Indigenous data is actually a a question of sovereignty that is um, a, politi a political political piece um, that we often see that nations retain but that Indigenous communities don't, um, but that Indigenous communities must retain um, as their sovereign right as well. Sorry, I don't know what else, yeah, add that too. So Jane, this is Shauna in um, Canada. I'm on Treaty 7 territory. Um, just picking up on what you're saying there um, and, and what our colleague in Costa Rica was saying, not, not every country, not every area has indigenous governance that's been established. Um, what, what, what are your thoughts for the people, researchers in those countries who, who don't have, um, who don't have the frameworks, the indigenous sovereign frameworks um, governance frameworks to work within, uh, but who are interested in working with data um, sovereignty, Indigenous data sovereignty. I'm going to defer to Maui and Stephanie on that. <laughs> I was actually going to say, you know, the 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 labels that Maui shared, the 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 traditional knowledge labels that that Jane's been working with, have been utilized in um, a, a vast array of different countries. And so we may not think, in some instances, that there are these governance, um, uh, you know, the, these we don't see a governance um, system that we expect to see. Um, but when you have these conversations in communities, there is um, knowledge and roles and ways of doing things that when you begin asking these questions, um, especially related to I'm thinking like for the, the TK labels around um, provenance and purpose and protocols, the answers are there. Um, and so it's sometimes we're looking for things that we um, that we expect to see, but there's there are things that already exist. Um, so I don't know if you have more to add to that, Jane, since I said that, or Maui from the BC labels experience, but the, I think that's definitely one of the answers there is that oftentimes we don't see what we expect to see, but the but knowledge about um, how and what should be said around um, usage, future, future usage, um, 
um, how things need to be cared for, who can access them, when they can be accessed, um, how you identify who, who it is or the collective. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I think that's a, a that's, um, really on point, Steph, that the, the, the governance doesn't look the same um, in every context and that um, what what one what are, what somebody who like just, just the the different kinds of cultural frameworks that we have in our own minds around what governance looks like or what authority within a particular kind of community context looks like or what a community looks like um, is going to be conditioned by one's own um, cultural framework itself and so that is really important but if you can kind of nuance those questions a little bit or kind of think about them in a different kind of way you find that there are answers and there are um, pathways in and I, I remember doing an enormous amount of work in Indonesia and um, uh, those questions of like well who's wh well where are the indigenous people and what are their governance structures and you know from the outside was one kind of question but when you're actually working with the communities and you're actually inside and kind of doing it, th those questions become really different um, because they take on a different kind of nuance and you can actually see the you can start to see the 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 various levels of authority that exist, um, but you kind of, if you can't, yeah. So you, nuancing the question, but also understanding the way in which you think it's going to look is not necessarily the way it's going to look. Just um, add in add in a little bit too. Um, you know, with the 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 project that was done around the data access protocols into the IDI. Now we're talking about kind of linked data sets, which people didn't have, um, you know, didn't have any kind of traditional uh, framework for. But it started off with conversations about how you would normally share traditional knowledge and what were the factors that were important in, in sharing that knowledge uh, with others. And um, then just having a chance to um, think about which, what elements could be extrapolated into this new context. And I think we're getting a similar sort of thing between the traditional knowledge labels where, you know, they're about things which people know about because it's their material and they have these, you know, ways in which they were, um, should be used. And then trying to think about how that, how that translates into biocultural labels where you're talking about gene sequences, which they weren't responsible for directly, but now they're just thinking about, okay, well, this, this makes sense to do it in this way. So it becomes, um, given the space, you can sort of staircase the thinking through into what uh, they would then see as an appropriate way of addressing um, a more contemporary expression of knowledge sharing. Uh, I think uh, hearing you, I think maybe for us, a way could be to, to open spaces for students, for university students from indigenous um, communities to begin to think and to, to speak between themselves about those issues, about what, uh, what, what, what is data, what, what, what is the indigenous data from the knowledge of, uh, of their communities and and how deep can that go and uh, because i think they can bring that uh, conversation to their communities especially in a country where it, that is a very new conversation and it's very new for us in the university imagine in other contexts and maybe the, those students can help us uh, bring that to life, okay, and, and, uh, and find the ways to build up those protocols, those ways of um, get to agreements, and 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 I think that, I don't know that it's very difficult to have an agreement for a whole country. Well, my country is smaller than than Ontario. <laughs> I know, 
<laughs> but still we have a lot of diversity <laughs> and and uh, and the people the communities uh, with nations as you call them um have their own diversities that just now they are beginning to find them and to define them because uh well we have been a, a country that uh, have been able to invisible invisibilize how do you say that visible invisible invisibilize something like that is that, is that the word uh the, the diversity we we are very proud to be the same we think that we are the same all the same we are and mm -hmm. and just i don't know since maybe 15 years ago something like that that began to be a movement in the country and and i think maybe with the students we can we, we can do something around that I wish we were there and able to learn. Actually, I'm so sad that we're not. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, and I think um, so. I, one of the experiences that I had from um, from the conference when we visited in Botswana. So Maui, I, one of you, Steph or Maui, showed the picture of us in Botswana, and um, the when we were talking with um, people from uh, Southern Africa about indigenous data sovereignty, the priorities um, that we heard, and I don't know if anybody here is from there, but um, the priorities we heard were quite different in a sense where it was sort of like indigenous um, groups felt invisible in the data and they wanted to be seen in data. So they wanted, so the priorities were really around wanting identifiers in the data, wanting ways for the data to be able to be used because when the data is all locked up and mixed in and you can't pull it out and braid it together and make something that um, is meaningful that tells a story, then it's really hard to use that data for Indigenous governance to support that Indigenous, that whole movement you're talking about, um, Gabriella, the, the idea that you know, those, those nations are building themselves, right? Um, and, and, and their identities. And so the data have to be there to help with that process. So it kind of can't be just like, okay, wait till they're fully formed and identified, you know, like there's not an end, right? So it's all part of a process. I think Stephanie, you might've shown that slide, I think. Um, that shows the, the sort of how it feeds each other. So yeah, I think that like really um, every place will have a different set of priorities to start with. Yeah. And just, um, you know, talking about that too, even, um, even in New Zealand where you have um, fairly good ethnicity data collection, but it then allows people to do sort of Maori, non-Maori comparisons. But, you know, people and communities will go, well, actually, I don't know who those people are. If you're just talking about Māori, you know, that's not kind of my people because you're a part of it, but it's not you. So you don't know what to do with the information. And unless you can get it down to something that better reflects that tribal group, they then feel like they're in a position to act on it in a different way. And, and that's, you know, what um, a lot of people are, uh, you know, so certainly we, we want data, not for the data, but for how it can make a change, how it helps us get resources so that then we can do something different for our, for our community. A question, is the interest, you are an interest group, no, or working group, no, interest group, just an interest idea. group. Yeah. With an yes. ID, yeah. Yes, and uh, do you have any kind of, uh, I don't know, um, activities or, um, I, I don't know how, how you work every day, I'm, I'm quite new in RDA too, um, to, I don't know, to, to share uh, 
knowledge and to, to, to share experiences and, and good practices, with, like let's say with us, like uh, we, can, we can have a group in, could be in Universidad Nacional and with people from communities, from indigenous nations, like to, to begin to build up uh, capabilities because there is something that even begin to, to, to agree what is data and what is indigenous data. And I don't know, some, something like, like co-data or something like that, that. Yeah, so we do have our Global Indigenous Data Alliance um, which we, uh, and so, and that's kind of a companion to the interest group here. And so our interest group has really been focused on research data to a large degree. And we formed GITA last year um, to have a broader scope globally um, for our, our networks and to be able to um, specifically reach out to and broaden our network. And so you see our network is very heavily um, North American, Australia, New Zealand, um, and um, we would we do have folks, so you've met Oscar, who are operating in other environments, but we want to, to strengthen that. And so um, I, I would say that that's probably the best way. So we operate offline from RDA, um, largely yeah. in those circles. Um, and so connecting it in that way. And I know that um, uh, we were, so Desi, Desi is also part of that group and we were very excited to hear, um, who was, was it uh, Magali? Was Magali, the young yeah. woman who's, yeah, who spoke with us at, at the plenary yesterday, um, who spoke very, uh, was very articulate about um, indigenous data and knowledge and sovereignty in Costa Rica. And so um, we were very excited about that and, and wanted to, um, uh, to try to reach out. And I know I had talked with um, uh, Anna uh, Zapone, who's the, one of the ones from the, um, the, the other plenary speakers from Costa Rica, who used to be oh. the indigenous um, yes. affairs liaison, yes, for the federal yes. government. Anna Gabriel. Gabriel. Yes, 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 yes. And so I think if we can connect that way, um, through all of that network with indigenous communities and leaders with the universities, um, and uh, that would be fantastic. And we are, we're very remiss because at RightsCon, I don't know if you, you know, RightsCon, but we were, uh, RightsCon was, it was supposed to be in Costa Rica this year as well as this event. And so we're looking forward to try to build connections and um, uh, through those. So if we can do that now virtually um, in place yeah. of that. Um, so definitely, I know you have my email, but be in contact with us about that. Okay, I, I will talk with with Magali and with Anna Gabriel, and then we can yeah. do something, the, a, a nice group there to begin okay. to talk to, to see what we can do. Thank you. Fantastic, and yes. Gabriella, so I'm Shauna from ORCID, and uh, we've been working with the GIDA group, and we've been hosting um, Indigenous Data Sovereignty webinars, and so we're actually just started planning um, a, a webinar for Latin America uh, for the early next year. And so I think you've been in contact with my colleague, Anna Cardoso. So she'll be reaching out to you soon to start to start coordinating this with all our ORCID members in Latin America. That's great, that's great. Yes, yes, with Anna, then to, 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 to write to me. <laughs> or to Perfect, Andrea. yep, yep. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. Well, we are at the end of our session now. Um, and we wanna thank everybody for attending and participating in the conversation and for making those connections. Um, as Maui said, we have another joint session tomorrow with the uh, FAIR Data Maturity Model Working Group, which will, which will delve more into application of FAIR um, and care, um, care with FAIR. And so uh, please join us at that um, session if you'd like and definitely connects about some of the issues and, and opportunities that we've brought up today. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thank really you. interesting. Thank you. Nice to meet you all.